When the Lord started dealing with me, I didn't want to because I, 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 I didn't feel I had the proper education. And uh, I was very, what's the right word? I was kind of backward. Hard to believe those of you that know me that I was, but I was. I didn't like to stand up in a crowd because I looked like three people standing there in one body. Those of you who know me knows what I mean by that too, my size. I didn't want to be a preacher. Amen. And uh, there's no preachers in my family. And the little church I come out of, we didn't have a pastor half the time. It lived out in the country. That's the truth. And I didn't know nothing about the gospel. Didn't really know what to do. But the Lord kept dealing with me. I said, Lord, I'll go. I'll preach the gospel. And when the Lord said, uh, the first guy come by had six members of his church. He said, come preach me a revival. I wasn't worried about the size of the crowd. I wasn't worried if they'd give me an offering or not. I just said, yeah. I was excited about it. I thought I was preaching a convention. They had six whole live bodies out there that I could preach to. We went about four weeks and had 34 got saved. I remember that revival. Amen. Uh, that guy, uh, that pastor had a brother in law, brother that pastored in Mustang, Oklahoma. I didn't know nobody was saved in Oklahoma. I didn't. He called and said, Come preach for me. I said, Where is your church? Mustang, Oklahoma. I didn't know where that was. He had a double wide trailer, had about 15 or 20. I was stepping up in the world. And so I went to that revival and we was there a couple of weeks. God blessed us and a fella came by and heard me preach and I never heard of him in my life and he had a big deep voice and his hair wasn't white yet and he pastored in Norman, Oklahoma then and that was 1975 and he said uh, uh, come and preach me a revival so we left and went to Norman and preached uh, two and a half weeks for Brother Don Rich and another fella come by I never heard of him in my life I never for, will forget the uh, first time I met Brother L.D. Moore and uh, I was preaching Brother Rich and he said, Brother Moore is here. You want to say something? He jumped up and he ran up to the front of the church. I'll never forget it. Pointed his finger at some man through the crowd and he said, if your mom and dad knew how you turned out, they'd turn over in their grave. He said, look at the mess your life is in. You need to straighten up, boy, and give your heart to God. I thought, what kind of man is he? Who is that wild man? I never seen him, never heard of him, didn't know. I thought, what is wrong with that guy? All I know is, now, if I'd have tried that, that guy would have come out and punched me out, you know. But you know why that aisle fell in the oven? I said, who in the world is that, Brother Rich? He said, man, you ain't been nowhere, have you? I said, no, not much. And he told me who he was. Well, revival broke out. We had a mighty move of God. Somebody said, uh, said, uh, what, what did you preach on? I said, I didn't preach on nothing. Said, there's, there's some preachers up the road here. Come up and point his finger at some guy's face and told him off. And he came down, got saved. We've been revival ever since. Yeah. Amen. That's why I viewed it as a young man. But I just went and just preached. Didn't know. Didn't know what you're supposed to do. Didn't know no politics of it. Didn't know, didn't know I was supposed to be afraid if my needs would be met or not. I, I didn't know I was supposed to be afraid. I think that's why I made it. I just didn't know. I just took off. And, uh, you know, started out, like I said, I remember coming home. Brian was a little baby. And uh, Missy was too. And, and we got to a place called Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and the car blew up. I had about 4 or $5 dollars in my pocket. And uh, I called home, and I said, Dad, my car's blew up. What should I do? He said, How far are you from a motel? I said, I can see one. He said, Walk and check in. Call me up and tell me exactly where you are. And I said, Okay. And uh, checked in the motel. He came and got me. It did, discouraged me a bit. I come home, and me and him and my brother went back, fixed the car, came back. Somebody said, boy, you're discouraged, ain't you? I said, about what? Didn't have no better sense than think I was supposed to be discouraged. Didn't know that didn't worry me any. Just kept right on preaching, just having a good time, trusting the Lord, believing God. And I thought God would take care of me, and, and uh, he has now for 27 and a half years that I stepped out on faith. Amen. Oh, I feel what I'm preaching. I'm just building up here a minute or two if you'll stick with me. 
I, I never did say when they asked me for revival, how many members do you have and are you going to take care of me or anything of the sort? I just said, when? Won't you come for a meeting? When? Let me know. And I went, Brother Coffee. Believe God. I'll never forget. I don't know if I've ever told this before. If I have, bear with me and I'll, I'll tell it again. I remember several years ago, and I hope nobody knows where this church is. Maybe I won't tell the city. But kind of north of here, maybe 50 miles, something like that. Up 75, I was going to a church, and, and I had preached a couple weeks, a two-week revival for them. And I remember I had to borrow money to get home. Now, that I remembered. I remembered that. And uh, anyhow, uh, I think I preached uh, two or three weeks and got about 20 or 30 dollars for the whole revival. I was really, really evangelizing, boys, I tell you. And I remember I, I had preached a hundred and some straight nights. I was tired. I had preached uh, uh, over 322 nights that year. I know because I documented it and wrote it down back when I used to evangelize. But I preached over a hundred straight nights. I was tired. I had two weeks off. I told my wife, I said, we're going to go to the home church Sunday morning. That's it. We're not going nowhere else, no other service. I'm going to sit right in this house, and I'm going to just read and pray, and I'm going to rest and sleep. That's what I plan on doing. And I got up, I got up that Monday morning, and I started praying. So help me. I believe God gave me a vision. I've seen this pastor come right before me, just as plain as could be, and he, and, and he said, help us. And I, I kind of shook myself out of that because I didn't want to go. I didn't want it to be God. I ain't going to lie to you, I didn't want to go. I was kind of like Lewis Dalton. Did anybody know Lewis Dalton? He said one time, he said, a pastor said, Brother Dalton, we can't afford to have you come back. He said, good, I can't afford to come back. I kind of felt like that. But I remember this well. So my wife was over there praying. And uh, uh, I went over and told her, I said, Diane, I said, I was over there praying, and brother so-and-so, he just came right before me. She said, my Lord, of all the places. She said, surely that ain't God. I said, no, I don't believe it is. Don't believe it's God. I said, anyway, if it's really God, he'll call me. Now, if that's really God, he'll call me. And uh, so help me, about five, ten minutes, phone rung. I thought, Lord, God, have mercy. I had the phone. I said, hello. He says, this you, brother Miller? It was him. I said, yeah. He said, just down praying. And while I was praying, he said, your face come right before me. And said, I heard you say, I'm coming to help you. I said, when you want me? He said, can you start tonight? I said, I'll be there tonight. I went, I preached that revival the two weeks I had off every single night. And had to borrow money to get home again. I was so discouraged. I told my, my dad, I said, Dad, I said, I'm heading to a little coal town in Virginia, a little bitty old tiny church, uh, Guest River. You don't know who it is just by that. That pastor's not alive anymore, but uh, well, I don't care to tell you. It's Brother E.B. Boland's church. I went down there. It's a little bitty church then. They hadn't built the big news church. A little church, handful of folks, coal mining town there at Norton. And I said, Dad, can you help me to get down there? He said, yeah. I remember what that revival, I thought, God, what will I do? And that has been about 24, 25, way over years ago, a long time ago. I remember I went down there to preach that revival, never opened my mouth, just smiled real big, and went to that revival. God gave us, I believe, is either 13 or 14 that got saved. Several got the Holy Ghost. We busted out in revival, and that little tiny coal town church gave us over $2,000, and that's 20-some years ago. Put four new tires on my car, bought my wife dresses, my kids clothes, even tried to buy me a suit, Wayne. Looked all over Virginia, couldn't find one to fit me. Looked everywhere, tried to find me one. I'm just saying this, uh, uh, they'll scrutinize and they'll put you under a magnifying glass uh, and they'll say, that preacher's in it for the money. Or that preacher only preaches in big churches. Or that preacher only preaches if it's a homecoming or a camp meeting or a youth rally. And they don't know the revival she preached to five and ten and twenty and the times you borrowed money to get home and the times that you prayed and prayed and thought, God, I bombed out tonight. Amen. 
I've had Brian call me before and say, Dad, I tell you, I preached so bad tonight, I wouldn't blame them if they never even shook my hand again, let alone ask me for another revival. Amen. And then uh, when I know he's had a good revival, he won't say it's good. I'll say, how did the revival go? Real good. Did you preach good? Well, he said, Lord, help me. I know he's saying, I really done good tonight. And he don't want to say it. But I know he gets scrutinized a lot. And uh, I don't know, I really feel like preaching this to you here for the Lord to help me. But look at this verse. He said, he said, now wait a minute. He said, don't I have this power? He said, don't I have power to forbear working at all? He said, who goes to war at his own charges? Was you, let me put my glasses on. Sorry. Nine years in the military, right? Did you finance your own self or did they give you, did they find, they financed you, right? They, they paid for that hat you wore and they gave you a uniform. And if you didn't want your own house, I had a brother in the military 23 years. So, I mean, you know, they'll, they'll give you somewhere to sleep. They'll give you food to eat. And uh, I know this, if you go to war, they'll buy the bullets. They'll give you, the, they'll buy the gun. And uh, they'll furnish everything. They'll expect you to go fight and put your life on the line and then finance your own gun and finance your own bullets. Somebody help me preach here. And I believe if a man of God says, here's my body, here's my mind, here's my ability, here's all i got, here's praying all hours of night, here's my fasting and my prayer, here's my faith, here's everything, and then they expect him to finance too? Somebody say amen. Amen. Praise God. Then he said, who plants a vineyard? Don't eat the fruit thereof. I've never been a good gardener. I hate to garden. I admit it. Never did like it. My mom and dad raised gardens all their life. I remember uh, we had to help. Dad would put a hole in your hand. He'd stick you out there and he'd say, hole. And I learned real young that you might as well do it if they put you out there. I remember one time uh, he put me out in the garden and I got this good idea. I thought what I'll do when I catch Dad looking at me, I'll just chop one of them stalks of corn down. He'll make me go to the house. And I, uh, it didn't work. I caught him looking out the corner of my eye, so I just whacked down a stalk of corn. He said, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I said, I missed. Well, I was lying, you know. So I waited a few more minutes, and he looked again. I whacked another stalk down. He didn't ask me what I was doing that time. He just whacked me in the head with the other side of the whole handle. I looked, and I said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, every time you cut down a stalk of corn, I'm going to peck you in the head. He said, I feel like after a few pecks, you'll learn how to hit the weed and not the stalk of corn. I learned. I knew. But I never did like to hoe in the garden. I didn't like to plow them. And I tell you, I lived on a farm. We raised cows. And we, when we had fertilized, it wasn't nitro. That's all I'll say. I have done a whole lot of shuffling and spreading a whole lot in my life. I hate it. I didn't like it. But I do like green beans, white half runners. I do like yellow corn when it's cut up and put in the freezer. And then you take it and rub, put it over, slice tomatoes the next spring. Whoo, Lord have mercy. I like that. I tell you this, if I'm going to work in a garden, I'm going to eat the fruits of it. I don't like working in a garden, but if I'm going to work, I want to root that garden. Is there anybody here? Well, maybe there is somebody, but there's not many folks that wants to plant a garden and fertilize it and cultivate it and spend money for the seed unless they have a hope someday of getting some beans and taters and tomatoes and so on. You want some of that. That's why you plant them. I don't know if the times I've seen Brother Collins walk in with buckets full of them big tomatoes. Amen. I've come to his house before. Walk into it. Well, I walked up or drove up to his house. And he said, get out of your car. You got any tomatoes? And he'll walk to the garden and start picking them. Say, here, take these home with you. Worked hard. Amen. To plant them. He said, uh, is there anybody feeds a flock? Doesn't eat the milk of the flocks. Anybody ever raise any cattle? I mean, when I was a boy, we used to raise uh, a lot of cows. When I was a boy, Dad used to buy them bucket calves. He'd buy 10 or 12 of them, you know, the, straight off the mama, not long, from dairy farms. And we'd have a bucket and, and have to stir up that uh, powdered milk and feed them little baby cows. As soon as they'd get able to eat grass, he'd put them on the pasture through the spring, sell them in the fall. Amen. He'd done that because he was hoping to make a little profit. 
but he'd always keep one. The one that gained the most weight. The one that looked the best. And we would have hamburger all fall and winter. Steak and roast and all them good things. Dad raised the cows because he was in hopes that through the winter time we'd have something good to eat. He said, now say I these things uh, as a man in verse 9, or does the law say the same thing? He said, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Or saith he it for our sakes? Yes, for our sakes, no doubt, it is written. He wrote this for our sakes. That if you labor in the gospel, that you should receive of the gospel. That you, that you, you should live in the gospel if you preach the gospel. If you plant the field, you ought to be willing and expecting to reap a harvest someday. Somebody say amen. I don't know how many men here would work all week long if on Friday after 60 or 80 hard hours of work, your boss come over and shook your hand and said, you don't know how much I appreciate all that hard work. If you want to, you can come back in Monday and not hand you no check. And then you go back and you work another week. And he said, you've done just as good this week. Boy, I'm glad you're here. Amen. You know why you work? You work because you hope to get a payday. How many works in here and you hope they pay you at the end of the week? Amen. Some of you don't care if you get paid or not. Lord have mercy. You know what? I remember Brian here calling me up. Last job he had, they asked him. He worked for a little IGA store by the time he was 15. He got to be 20 and they asked him to be an assistant manager of an IGA store. He was so thrilled, he called it, Dad, you ain't gonna believe it. They just told me that I got the job. I am the assistant manager. I can do this and I can do that. I have this power and that power. I said, how much are they paying you? He said, I don't know. I said, you're crazy, boy. Man, you ain't no son of mine. He said, I don't know, I didn't ask him. He said, what would you have done? I would have said, how much? What's my benefits? I said, he said, yeah, but what well, then hired me? I said, I want the water the job. Right. Amen. Amen. That's I, I, I tell you what, you work, you expect to receive. That's the way it ought to be. Now, he said in verse 11, if I'm sown to you spiritual things, is it a great thing that I should reap your carnal things? That's no big deal. He said, if I sow spiritual things to you, it's not a great thing that I reap your carnal things. Amen. I thank God for those men of God that have labored in the gospel. Amen. I feel like I could preach this. I'm not a novice. I'm not a beginner. And I, I'm not wanting an offering. I pastor my own church that's extremely well to me. I really I feel like this. I think some older preachers need to preach this for no other reason that younger ones would get a hold of it and take on the message. Amen. You ain't helping a congregation or when you won't teach them to give. You're hurting your congregation. Somebody said to me once, I won't preach tithing because I'm afraid to put them up my people in a hard place place. I said, I do preach tithing because I don't want my people to get in a hard place. That's why I preach it. Amen. I think you cheat your people. If you don't preach them a holiness standard, you're not helping them. If you don't preach them tithing, you're not helping them. If you don't preach some of these things that the world calls hard, amen, I call it, uh, I call it simple, amen, it helps. I'm glad somebody told me about it, amen. I'll tell you, I, I say this from my heart, and I wouldn't say this at many churches, but I feel at home here among you. I know most of you have been I've never had God bless me so much. I told him, Brother Wayne, I said, if God don't bless me, I don't know what I'm going to do. And for about the last four or five years, it's been unbelievable. I am not kidding you. I, I don't want to say too much because some folks think you boast. You know, I don't want, I'm not that way. God knows I'm not that way. I still have struggles at times. I still have hard times, but not too many. Amen. I did for about 25 years. But the last four or five years, I've just said, God, where's it coming from? How's it getting here? And why are you keep on pouring it on me? But the more he's been pouring it on me, the more I've been pouring it back out. Amen. The more God's been given, the more I've been given. The more God's blessed me, the more I've been blessing others. I've been preaching harder and harder and harder. I'll tell them, Brother Browning, Brother Chris Browning's one of our preachers. 
He's a good one too. I preached one message one summer on living between the promises. And it's, it's a lot about giving. And I preached it about ten times. And brother, at ten different churches, and Chris was about seven or eight of them. He come to me and he said, you know what? He said, uh, I don't want to take your message and preach it. But I just want to make sure that every time you preach it, I'm with you. I said, what do you mean? He said, every time I go with you and you preach that message, somebody gives me something. He said, I just want to be there. I just want to stand by you and smile. Just let me stand there and grin. He said, God's been, God's been blessing me. I looked the other day, though, and Brother Chris said that kidding. And he's talking about how much God's blessed him. He never told me this, but the other day, somebody, a missionary, from way down, long way from here, he sent us a little uh, a brochure of folks that's helping him buy a, a, a van. And I was looking at all the churches and individuals, and I looked and said, Chris Browning had a dollar a mouth. I said, Chris, was that you? He said, yeah, but I had no idea they was going to tell nobody. You know what? That's why God's blessing him. But Chris told me, he said, God's really been helping me. God's been taking care of me. But Chris has been uh, doing for God. And that's why God's blessing him. If you don't like what I'm saying, uh, and you say, uh, I don't believe what Brother Miller's preaching, you don't have to get in on the flood of blessings. But if you really want some good advice, try this. Man, it works. I'm telling you, it works. Who is these guys? These guys, they get up and they say, come out here to this seminar. I'll tell you how to buy real estate. And you make a whole lot of money. And folks give them a whole lot of money to learn how to sell real estate so they can make a whole lot of money and they ain't got nothing. But they don't care to spend $500 for a real estate package. Learn how. They don't care. They try every little get-rich-quick scheme that comes by and they wind up losing everything they got. But just the basic, plain, hard Simple facts about giving. Now I believe it's I believe that somebody said you believe in tithes or offerings. I said yes. I believe in tithes and offerings and alms. I believe in all of it. Amen. If you'll do that, God will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you can't receive. Let me tell you what happens. If you preach holiness and you stay very long, you'll have a holiness church. You might not for a few years. But if you stay long and you preach holiness, you have a holiness church. If you stay long and you preach giving, you'll have a prosperous church. If you stay long and you preach faith, you'll have a church that's got a lot of faith. I'm telling you, your church will be what you preach. Your children will be what you teach them. I heard that young man say he had a good holiness mother took him to church. He said, I got away from God. Why is he back? Because in his mind and in his heart, he remembered my holiness mother that pounded it in my hand that told me I need to go to church. And when he realized where he was, he said, I got to find my way back to the highway of holiness church. That's why it was put in his heart and pounded in his mind. I recently had a man in my church said, Brother Miller, you pound that in and you beat it and you pound it in the heads of these folks till they're almost brainless. I said, I'd like to get them completely. Amen. I'm serious about what I'm preaching. He said, it's a necessity. I'm going to preach the gospel. It doesn't matter. He said, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But against my will, then a dispensation of the gospel committed unto me. What reward do I have then? That I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. That I abuse not my power in the gospel. He said, I'm never charged. You know what? I wouldn't give you two cents for a preacher who is for sale. I wouldn't give you two cents for a preacher who said. Now listen, here's how I believe. Had the Florida boys call me one time. If you like the fan of those folks, I don't mean to be hateful. But they called me and said, we want to come to your church and sing. I said, well, there's a couple reasons I didn't let them because I got a picture of them. So because of that, I said, I don't think so. And they said, well, said, all you have to guarantee us is $800 a night. That's all. I said, that's the second reason you ain't coming. Because if they would have came for nothing... I'd have tried my best and I'd have pulled and struggled to get everything I could. I don't have nobody preach for me to try to set a price. Ain't no way. Amen. You go and God gives. Somebody help me preach here tonight. Don't get me wrong. You can't put a price on the gospel. But on the other hand, you can't give too much to the man who carries the gospel. He can't put a price on his ministry and you can't either. 
you couldn't pay the preacher what he's worth. It'd bankrupt your church if you paid Brother Collins what he's worth. I'm serious. Oh, he's saying it because they're buddies. No, I'm not. I'm saying it because it's the truth. It'd bankrupt the highway if they tried to pay him what he's worth. I'd say it'd bankrupt Springdale if they paid me what I was worth. I don't mean that because I think I'm somebody. I just think there's nothing greater than a man or woman that'll preach the gospel and stand up and preach the truth without fear and waver. Oh, my friend, I'm preaching you tonight because I love you. I might leave and you may not love me as much, but I'm telling you the truth. Let me go quick. I'm going to try to get done about eight or ten minutes. Amen. Two things here. Look at this. In Deuteronomy 16, 19, he said, We should not rest judgment that thou have respect to persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the works of righteousness. He said, If all you're doing it for is a gift, it'll blind your eyes. There's been people that's been bought off and their eyes has been blinded because of a gift. Come on, somebody help me preach here. Brother Miller, you ain't never had that happen. Oh, man, you just don't know. Yes, I have. I've probably told this. I know I've told it several times. Can't remember where I told it when I didn't. But I was preaching at a large assembly of God church about 15, 20 years ago. Can't remember exactly a long time ago. man came to me and it was at a, a time when it had to be more than 20 years ago. I was still evangelizing. But he came to me and he said, See that woman over there? Which woman? That one right there. He is about 55 or 60. She's about 25. He is ugly as sin. She's a very attractive young lady. I guess that don't matter. But anyway, I had eyes I could see. And he said, If you'll prophesy to her and tell her that God wants her to marry me, he said, I'd really appreciate that. I said, You are kidding me. He said, No, man, I ain't kidding you. She's got a lot of confidence in you and your wife. He said, just go tell her. He said, there'd be no harm in that. I said, I know it's the will of God. I said, man, you're crazy. He said, look, I ain't asking for nothing for free. Rest in his pocket, pulled out a wad and choke a horse. And he had, God, I would be afraid to say how many $100 bills and $50 bills in his big, thick wad out of his pocket. One of them I'd have left have had. One. He said, I'll give it all to you if you tell her. I said, I can't do it. God hadn't told me that. He said, well, he said, don't matter. Just, just tell her. Here, here, here. He put it in my pocket. I gave it back to him. I said, get away from me. Get away from me. I went right over and told his pastor. I said, you see that man? He said, which one? I said, that one there. I said, man, this guy's a hypocrite. What are you talking about? I told him what he'd done. I said, man's a hypocrite. He said, you call me a hypocrite? I said, yeah, you are a hypocrite. Amen. I told him to his face. Amen. devil told me, he said, you ain't hardly got enough money to buy a loaf of bread. And, and, and look what you did tonight. Amen. I preach the truth. I'm not going to let a gift blind me. You, you can't take me to Ponderosa Steakhouse and get me to quit preaching on sin. Amen. You can't buy me a new pair of shoes. You know these shoes I got on? See these things I got on? Amen. They're called Echoes. I'd never bought them. I would have never bought them. Not because they're toes are square and I like round ones. Not because of that either. My foot started hurting a while back and I had bone spurs in it. I went to the doctor. He said, you need a real good pair of shoes. And uh, some man in my church, an elder man in my church, he went to a store and he said, have you got any shoes that's good for real big men, bless his heart, that's got bone spurs and diabetics? He said, I have, but they're around $200 a pair. He said, I don't care how much they are. He said, have you got a pair? And he said, yeah. He called me up and said, run down there to that store and said, ask for this person. Got you something. I went down. I said, uh, I'm supposed to pick something up. I said, are you a size 12 wide? I said, yeah. I looked at the price and I like to fell over. I said, brother, I didn't want you to do that. He said, I just felt like doing it for you. Amen. Best things I ever had on in my life. Whoo, glory to God. Can't even hardly tell them. Feel like I'm walking on air. I'd have never paid that kind of price for a pair of shoes. I buy them, I buy them uh, on sale at Walmart's. I buy them twelve dollars a pair if I can find them twenty dollars a pair if I can find them. Amen. Got them shoes and I said, brother, had no idea you paid that kind of price. I, I, I feel terrible. I don't even feel like. Well, I, I do feel like wearing them. I said, I don't feel like I'll take them. He said, it's all right. He said, the only thing I want you to do is I want you to pray for my son. So he's been trying to get this job for two or three years. He, he lost a job making about $20 an hour and been working for about 10 
And he said, uh, pray for him. He's got a big family. And when you get up around 45, 50, it's hard to get a good job like that. And I said, okay, I will. I went serious to prayer and said, God, please help his son. He called me up about three days later and said, have you been praying? I said, yeah. He said, my son got called to work today starting out $27 or $28 an hour. At the same kind of job he lost, just at a different car company. Amen. You don't have to shout with me, but I said, thank you, Lord. I believe God blessed the man. You don't want to do it? Well, you won't get the blessing. Let me do it. I'll try it. Since I've been trying it, I just can't believe how God's been blessing me. I wish I could put it all over the country and get folks to listen to me because I feel like I can help them. Amen. God is a great God, isn't He? Amen. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about doing things for wrong. You know what? When, uh, when Belshazzar seen that vision and, and uh, you all know the story about that and they called for a prophet, they told him, said, we'll give you these great gifts if you'll tell us the interpretation. You know what he said? He said, I'll tell you the interpretation, but I don't want a gift. He received no gift, and he wouldn't have got one anyway after he said that handwriting on the wall meant this. You're waiting to bounce us and found wanting. God's numbered your kingdom, and he's divided it. Amen. You're going to fall, brother. You know why? He told him the truth, whether he liked it or not. Preach it whether they like it or not. Don't preach to please men. Amen. Don't sing because it's their favorite song. Sing what God gives you. Preach what God gives you. And where others will say, I hope you don't make it. God will speak to one that will say, come here, I'm going to help you make it. Where somebody will say, look at that guy. I wish he'd do this or that or the other. God will have somebody else say, come here, let me help you on your way. And the Lord will bless the one that did that. And he'll bless the man of God. Amen. He said, they've been examining me. And he said, for all of them that's been examining me, here's my answer. He had an answer. He said, I've been under the glass. I've been scrutinized. Amen. I have been. Let me read it to you again. He said, my answer to them that do examine me is this. I'm going to close. He said, this is my answer. I know I've been, you've been examining me. I know you've been looking at me and checking me out. Here's my answer to you. If you plant a vineyard, do you hope to eat of it? If you raise a flock, do you want to eat part of it? Here's my answer to you. He said, do you muzzle an ox when he treads out corn? Here's my, you want my answer? He said, I could totally forbear work if I wanted to. That's what he said. Isn't that what he said in verse number six? Do I not have the power to forbear working whatsoever? Amen. He went right down the line. That's my answer. Amen. Yeah. I'll give him the answer. Praise God. This is my answer. And I'll tell you the results. If you will trust God, step out on faith, bless God, bless God's man, bless God's church, bless the mission field. Amen. If you ain't got a quarter to give, pray for him. Amen. And what? You know what? There's a guy by the name of, uh, of Brother Dean. Amen. Brother Dean was an old fella that was blind with, in one eye, and he's very, very sick and old. I was preaching a revival in Virginia several years ago. In that revival, I had different ones. You know how some churches are overly good. And they, some would bring us in food. Others might bring in something, give it to you. And so on. This brother didn't have anything, Brother Wayne. But I remember he come in one night. He said, Brother Miller, and he, he had a kind of a speech problem. He said, Brother Miller, I don't know how much to give you. That's kind of how he talked. He said, but I found this tight, tight cliff. Is that how you say it? He said, I wanted to give you this. He said, it's the best thing I had. It wasn't a tie pin at all. It was a, 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 one of those things that holds a, woman's, holds a woman's sweater together. You know what I mean? And you put it on one end of the sweater, and there's a little chain, and you put it on the other end of the sweater. And the little piece uh, that was on the white plastic part had fell off, and the old dried glue was there. But you know what? He meant well. He said, I want to give you this. I said, thank you, Brother Dean. I sure do appreciate that. He said, thank you, wear it one night. Man, I never did wear tie, tie pins. I said, yeah, I'll wear it tomorrow night. My wife said, you don't wear that? I said, I sure am. I had to rig it up because it wasn't made for it, but I rigged it up. I come walking right in. It's a pretty good-sized church I was in, too. Call the name. Everybody know where it was. Pretty good-sized church. 
Oh, I had two or three of them come by and they snickered and they laughed. I can't believe Brother Miller. He looks stupid tonight. One of them come up to me and said, Brother Miller, what have, in the world have you got on your necktie? I said, don't say a word about that. Now, brother, give me that. And he thinks it's a tie cl clisp or claps or whatever it call them. So I don't know what you call them. I said, so I'm wearing it. He said, well, I'd have told him that wasn't what it was. He said, that's a woman's sweater. I said, I know what it is. I just wore that thing. Had the church, he walked up to me with his one good eye. And he said, do you like it? I said, I never had one like it. <laughs> yes, sir. I wore it. He just smiled, stuck out his chest. And he said, I'll try to find something else to bring you tomorrow night. I said, okay, okay. But I wore it with pride because I knew he gave it from his heart. From his heart. Amen. You know what? It, it's not always what you give. If you just walk up sometimes and say, you know, Brother Colin, I sure did enjoy that song you sung. He'll walk out of here with his head high thinking, I'll help somebody. Amen. It's not always monetary things. Just to say, Brother, you, you've been a help to me. Amen. I appreciate that message that you preached. Thank God. Oh, I feel what I'm preaching, Brother Collins. I know I'm too lengthy. But tonight, listen, folks, there's an answer to this thing. Don't get in the crowd that gets the preacher and puts him under a microscope and starts trying to check out every move he makes, everything he does. Oh, I caught him. I caught him. Wednesday night, we thought he was still in Kentucky at that funeral. He's right up there at the house on the telephone. Now, that man should have been down here in church. He had no right up there on that telephone. Should have been down here. Amen. No, don't join that crowd. Don't join that crowd. Join that crowd. Said, bless that good man of God. He's probably wore a plumb out. Pray God gave him strength, let him sleep tonight. Come on, somebody help me preach tonight. Amen. You know what? Somebody comes in my church with a new car. I don't tuck my head down, start whining, and say, how come I ain't got one? I say, man, that's a nice looking car. Can I look at it? Whoo, look at that thing. That's nice. I like it. I like that car. Amen. And you know what? I bought three brand new Lincoln Town cars since I pastored that church. And the first one I bought, I had five or six people in 1988 said, well, I think I'm going to start preaching. I think I'll be a pastor. I see where it all is. I know how it is. And some of them, you know what I did? I just smiled and went on, Brother Collins. And my wife said, let's sell it. They're not liking it. Let's get rid of it. I said, they wouldn't like it if I had a Volkswagen. They wouldn't like it no matter what. I don't care. I, I said, I'm God's man. And I'm going to hold my head high. And I'm going to drive it. I put 168,000 miles on it. Amen. Bought it new, put that many miles on it, sold it to another man. He drove it 330 or 40,000 miles, still driving it. If I'd have known it, it lasted, I'd have kept it. Bought another new one in 93. Bought another new one in 98. And my wife taught me out of it to buy a minivan. Ain't hey, that something? Had no minivan when I had children. But now that I've got grandchildren, things have changed. Amen. You know what? Some people think it's a crying shame for a preacher to have a new car. Amen. But you know what they'll do? They'll go on strike if they don't get that extra 30 cents. They'll go on strike and they'll walk a picket line and somebody walks through, they'll hit him in the head with a rock. Amen. You know it's the truth. Fighting for that extra quarter. Fighting for that extra day off. Amen. And, and I tell you what, I preached this one day. I, God help me, i got to hurry. I was preaching this one day at another church. Had no idea. You know, some people get mad at the preacher. He don't even know what, what he's saying. One night I was preaching in, in um, central Alabama at this church, and I said this. I said, you know what? I said, if some uh, sister would walk up to this pastor and hand him $40 and say, I felt like giving you this. And I said, he spent that $40. I said, they'd call a board meeting and try to have him vote it out because he's spending God's money. And I said, I said, if, if before I'd be in a shape like that, I'd pray to Jesus come. You know what? I walked by shaking hands at church. And I started shaking hands this man. He said, I'm not shaking your hand. He said, you had no right to say that tonight. I said, brother, I didn't mean to offend you. He said, you knew I said that. You knew I did. I said, I didn't. I don't know what you're talking about. Pastor come up and he said, hey, 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 hey. He didn't know. He said, I don't believe you. You're lying. We walked away to everybody left. He said, that sister sitting on that row, a certain row, 
handed Pastor forty dollars just last night and said, I feel like giving you this. And said, I told him, don't spend God's money, but he spent it anyway. And said, he told you and you tried to preach on me. I said, I didn't know. You know, why was it I didn't say $50? Why didn't I say 50 You know why? Because God had his number. Because that man had that pastor under a microphone or microscope. Amen. And he was checking, watching every movie made. Watching to see. Amen. Going to gripe and complain about any good thing was done. Amen. And, uh, and here, God sent a man hundreds of miles away, called the exact amount out, and said, you try to, and you know what he did? He tried to have a board meeting the next day. Tried to. Thank God he was the only man on the board that was mad at the preacher. All the rest of them took up for him. Lord have mercy. When you get quiet, it makes me wonder. I just preach him what God gave me. I've been pastor for years too. Amen. I know how it is. Here's how most people are. If they make fifty thousand a year, as long as you don't make fifty one, you're okay. But if they make seventy, you can make all the way up to sixty eight or nine. If they make ten, you can make eight or nine. Don't you make eleven? Jealousy is cruel. It's cruel. You know how I feel? Amen. When a man of God comes to our church to preach, I'm going to tell this, Brother Collins. Get ready to give us a song. One time I had a board meeting. We, our first evangelist that we had 18 years ago. And I said, matter of fact, he's a member of this church now. They, they said, you can only give the evangelist three offerings a week. No four. You can give him Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Tuesday goes to the youth, Saturday and Sunday to the church, Sunday morning, Sunday school. Well, I just don't want to to anyway. You know, I, so Brother Irvin Steele told me, I said, what do you do as a pastor? He said, listen to everything they say, take it with good consideration, pray about it and do what you want to do anyway. Right. Anyhow, now I said that with a good spirit. But I considered it and I said, no, I don't think that's the way to do it. So anyway, we had this evangelist, and they gave him like $100 for seven nights. So I told the treasurer, I said, write us a check at the end of the week. He said, my God, he's got $100. What do you want him to get? Well, that's 18 years ago. I said, at least five or six. Sure. My Lord, you want him to be rich? I said, yeah. I did. Wish he was. He said, there ain't no way I'll fight you to the last over this. My goodness, I've been pastoring three months. What do I do? So I just got up that Friday night. I said, now, folks, we have two options. This brother's been here five or six, been here since Saturday night, and here it is Friday. I said, I, I told him. I told on him, God helped me. I was a tattletale when I was a young pastor. I wouldn't do it now. But I said, you know what? I said, I tried to get him write a check, and they said $100 was enough for any preacher. So I said, we've got two options. We're either going to get a real good offering tonight or we've had our last revival as long as I pastor at Springdale. There'd be no more revivals until you vote me out. If we ain't paying him, I'm not asking him to come. You want a revival, I'll preach it. That's going to be it. Took up that offering. We got a great offering. It's about four or $500, a whole lot of money. You know, there's only one guy got mad. My treasurer that I asked to write the check. He come up, he said, that's a shame and a disgrace. It's a disgrace that a preacher, that all he does is stand up there and preach and get $500. He said, that's a disgrace. I never thought I'd see the day they'd pay a preacher like that. Amen. Well, since then, God's poured out on our church. God, I said, we're going to start a mission program. Who do we support as missionaries? Bless God let them support themselves. I said, well, let's try to help them a little bit. I got up and I said, we want to support some missionaries. Will anybody help me? I had one woman, Sister Jan, said, I'll help you. The only one in the whole church, Wayne. They said, we ain't helping them. I said, we are going to help them. Since we did, God started pouring out his blessings. God started blessing us left and right. Amen. Now, I guarantee you, if I died, resigned, or got voted out tomorrow, I guarantee you the next pastor come in there, they wouldn't be not one word said. Not a word. Amen. Because now, let me tell you, the last revival we had, you know what? I said something. I, I, I hardly ever announced. I don't even say what to get. I just say thank you for the offering. I post it on a bulletin board once a month. If somebody asks me, I tell them. I don't try to make a, a, a spectacle of it. 
I just say, let's give good, and I drop it. But I had this preacher preach this revival. God blessed him so good. One guy come to me and said, how much did he get this week? I said, he got real good. How much? I said, well, I think he's got $3,865. He said, here, let me give you $135 so it'd be $4,000. You know what? He didn't say, my God, I can't believe he got that good. You know what some pastors would say? You know what? Now that would be eight weeks of my salary, what I get. Eight weeks. He got one week when I got an eight. I didn't walk around and say, that ain't fair. It's two months before.